George A. Romero was a great American artist. From his earliest roots as an industrial filmmaker to his rise as a popular entertainer, Romero's work was always distinguished by a strong work ethic, an independent mindset, and a firm commitment to contemporary subtextual themes. His unusual style and rebellious countercultural attitude never quite found a place in the larger industry. But Romero brought a distinct intelligence and personality to a variety of genre efforts, creating movies of humor and irony that told genuinely disturbing stories of human failing and social commentary. His films took a sharp scalpel to the values of middle-class America in the late 20th century, and they remain some of the most incisive portraits of their time. Romero's name, however, will forever be linked to the birth of the modern zombie genre, which permanently altered the tradition of the horror film. His versatile monsters have been adopted to an increasing medley of purposes by storytellers the world over, in mediums ranging beyond film into comic books, television, literature, and video games. One of the most significant appropriations of Romero's innovation was the widely influential Resident Evil series, largely responsible for popularizing the survival horror genre. The games drew interest in a film adaptation almost immediately, and during the long five-year struggle to make this a reality, several directors grappled with the challenges of translating its story and gameplay into a cinematic form, among them the paternal icon himself, George Romero. When a Japanese video game company called Capcom released their new horror game, Biohazard, for the original PlayStation system in 1996, there was a great deal of doubt. The game had gone through three years of development and was reconceptualized several times. It began as a remake of the Famicom game Sweet Home, a prototype survival horror piece adapted from a film of the same name, noteworthy as an early effort by director Kiyoshi Kurosawa, who later rose to international prominence in 2001 with a terrifying pulse. The project was eventually handed over to an up-and-coming designer named Shinji Mikami, whose previous Disney-licensed titles had done well for the company. Mikami, influenced by zombie cinema and especially the work of George Romero, started making changes. He moved the developing game away from its supernatural origins, switched the perspective from first person to third person, and utilized full motion video to create an enhanced feeling of realism and immediacy. No one really expected it to hit as big as it did. The game flew off the shelves in Japan, and after it was localized for Western players, retitled Resident Evil, it sold equally well in North America and the UK. Critically acclaimed and controversial for its frightening atmosphere and visceral intensity, it was seen as a breakthrough in gaming, becoming the best-selling PlayStation title of its day. By January 1997, a production company had purchased the screen rights to the game. It wasn't anyone in Hollywood that spotted the potential. Rather, it was a German outfit, Constantine Film, that seized the opportunity. This might seem unusual, if not for the fact that Constantine Film is among the biggest and most successful German production companies of the last few decades. The studio had hit its commercial stride in the 1980s under the management of Bernd Eichinger. Eichinger, in addition to fostering major German talents like Wolfgang Petersen and Uli Edel, 
was an ambitious producer eager to take on Hollywood with enormous German productions designed for an international market. In films like The Neverending Story and The Name of the Rose, he strove to, and succeeded, in proving that Europeans were equally capable of producing work as fantastic and extravagant as anything being made in America. Later, he earned Oscar nominations with arresting dramas like Downfall and the Bader Meinhof Complex. Eichinger was arguably gunning for the American market even more heavily in the 90s, financing period dramas, slapstick comedies, and an adaptation of Marvel's Fantastic Four, co-produced with Roger Corman, that ultimately went unreleased. Resident Evil seems to have been taken on as part of this general trend towards properties with an inherent appeal to American audiences. The first person hired to work on the film was writer Alan B. McElroy. McElroy started his screenwriting career in the late 80s, working on the fourth entry in the Halloween franchise. Over the years, he has written for film, television, video games, and comic books. At the time of his hiring on Resident Evil, he would have just completed work on his highest profile job yet, co-writing the screen adaptation of Todd McFarlane's Spawn, a comic series for which he had previously penned stories. In May 1998, details of his Resident Evil script were leaked to PlayStation Magazine. In an article published on ain'titcool.com, not only is Romero's rumored connection to the film already being mentioned, we are provided also with a complete synopsis of McElroy's screenplay. Aside from minor alterations, it sounds very similar to the original game. In the first Resident Evil, players took control of either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine, members of the Special Operations STARS unit sent to investigate mysterious occurrences outside Raccoon City. After being attacked by mutant dogs, the team holes up in a seemingly abandoned mansion, which turns out to be a secret lab run by the Sinister Umbrella Corporation. The lab was being used to develop a devastating biological weapon called the T-Virus, which ran out of control and is now escaping. Players must solve puzzles, battle zombies, mutated sharks, snakes, and plants before defeating the villainous double agent Wesker by destroying Umbrella's ultimate experiment, a grotesque super soldier dubbed Tyrant, and escaping before the lab self-destructs. In McElroy's script, the story focuses on a similar elite government team, which may or may not be stars, sent to break into a laboratory located in Raccoon Forest, where, recently, a SWAT unit investigating reports of strange creatures has disappeared. Upon arrival, the team is attacked by mutant dogs and finds refuge in a strange mansion, which turns out to be the secret lab. There, they battle zombies, giant wasps and spiders, and other results of experiments gone horribly wrong. Eventually, they discover the whole thing was a setup, meant to provide subjects to infect with the menacing T-Virus, though there's no mention here of the Umbrella Corporation. At the end, Jill and Chris, the two remaining survivors, fight off the tyrant, which turns out to be an infected Wesker, destroy the lab, and escape with the antidote. When McElroy's script was apparently deemed unsatisfactory, the production turned to another writer, who, in an added bonus, could act also as the film's director, horror legend George Romero. Resident Evil came along at a very strange time in Romero's career. He had risen in total independence with the success of midnight hits like Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, movies which gave birth to the modern iteration of the zombie. He'd founded his own company, independently financed movies for distribution by major studios, and in general, tried to maintain a healthy distance from Hollywood. All that changed 
in the 80s. Studios were getting bigger, movies were getting more expensive to make, and small companies like his were finding it harder to survive. After disagreements with his producer, Romero left his company to, for the first time, find work as a director for hire on studio projects. The results were good, as can be seen in the bizarre yet suspenseful Monkey Shines and the intelligent and underrated Stephen King adaptation, The Dark Half. But the adjustment to his new environment was challenging. Creative control was difficult to maintain, the ending to Monkey Shines was changed against his wishes, and disaster could spring from any direction, like when Romero's distributor, Orion Pictures, went bankrupt, which left his movie, The Dark Half, sitting on a shelf for almost two years. In the 90s, Romero didn't fare much better. For basically the entire decade, he would become involved in a succession of major projects that all became lost in development hell. Among them was a ghost story titled Before I Wake, and a reboot of Universal's The Mummy. This latter film actually came quite close to being made, even getting a green light from the studio, before it was undone by contractual issues. Director Steven Summers later took the project over, and filmed it as a big, fun, fairly straightforward action-adventure, highly imitative of the Indiana Jones films, and a long ways off from Romero's plan to make it a more modest, classical horror piece. With feature films proving almost impossible to get off the ground, Romero struggled to find work. He filmed half of an Edgar Allan Poe diptych with Dario Argento called Two Evil Eyes in 1990, and in 1998 directed a pilot for a show called Iron City Ass Kickers that was never aired. One of the other jobs Romero took that year was filming a live-action promotional spot for Capcom's newly released Resident Evil 2. The spot, fast-paced and stylized, featured young, up-and-coming American actors Brad Renfro and Adrian Franz, with makeup effects by Screaming Mad George, the artist behind the unforgettably freakish effects for Brian Usna's Society. When Romero made this promotional short, which wound up airing only in Japan, he hadn't been able to direct a film in nearly 10 years.